Hi, this is Henning from Flip Normals. And in this video, we will cover the sculpting tools in Blender. We will go through the general workflow and how you can get started with sculpting right away. Before we get too deep into the video, we just wanna quickly talk about our new introduction to sculpting in Blender course. This is a course of around seven hours where you will learn everything you need to know about sculpting. We go far more in depth in this course than we do in this video where you will learn how to sculpt up this monkey at the end where it takes a sand through and really sculpt her up along with understanding sculpting techniques and sculpting concepts. So with that out of the way, let's jump into Blender. The first thing you have to do before you get started with sculpting is you have to go into the sculpting tab. The sculpting tab looks quite different from the layout tab and it has some custom hotkeys set up. So you definitely want to be in the sculpting tab. Second off, what you want to do is if we hit control and tab, you can go into different modes. You want to make sure that you are in the sculpt mode. If you are in object mode, the interface changes and you can't really sculpt. So make sure you hit control and tab and then you go into sculpt mode. If you have an object selected and you go into the sculpting tab, you will automatically go into the sculpting mode. So getting started with the interface, on the left, we have the various brushes. If you hold down the middle of this button, you can scroll up and down this list. In the top left, we have different settings such as the brush radius and the brush strength and some other brush settings as well. Then in the top right, we have settings such as dyne topo and remeshing and symmetry. And here, all the way to the right, we have the general interface, which you are familiar with from regular Blender. If we zoom in a little bit on this guy and we want to start sculpting, we can just start with the sculpt draw brush. And then the way we sculpt is simply by using the left mouse button. The left mouse button is simply just me clicking with the tablet. And if you're not using a tablet, I highly recommend that you get a tablet. If you want to sculpt inwards, you can hold on a control key and just sculpt regularly as well. And that's gonna sculpt inwards. So left mouse button to sculpt out and control to sculpt in. If you want to change the brush size, you can hit the F key and you can just drag left and right and that's gonna change the brush size. So now we have a much smaller brush. If you want to be bigger, you just drag left and or left to right and then you can get a bigger brush. If you want to change the intensity, you can hit the Shift F and now you can see we changed the intensity here. So if you want to be really low, you just set it to something low and now you can barely see it and Shift F again and now it's gonna be really hard. So you can also change these up here as well. That said, I never really use these buttons up here or these sliders up here at all. I just use the F uh, to change the brush size and Shift F to change intensity. If you want to smooth out your sculpt, you can also just hold on the Shift key while you are sculpting and it's gonna smooth out your sculpt like so. So let's cover the brushes. There are too many brushes to cover and there are too many brushes to really be used in a proper workflow. So we are only gonna be covering a few brushes. The first thing we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be hovering over just this line. And now you can see that we can expand it from left to right. So we expand it once. Now you can see we can see more brushes. And if we expand it again, now you can see their names. I highly recommend that you do this because these icons are not exactly clear on what they're doing. So if you just expand it out like this, like this, then you can see their names and you can see what they're actually doing. And like I said before, if you want to see more of them, you can of course scroll down like this, but you can also just hold on the middle mouse button and just drag up and down. Now, this is where brushes become a little bit scary because there are simply too many of them. And the truth is that you can get all the sculpting you ever need done with only a select few brushes. In my day-to-day -day sculpting workflow, I'm using something like three or four brushes for the vast majority. So we'll be starting with the draw brush. That is simply the standard brush, which you'll be using for most regular sculpting. Nothing too fancy about this one. This one allows us to simply to go up and down if we hold down a control key. This is also what's called the standard brush in ZBrush. It's, very, it's a very easy, nice brush to use, which you can use to create these nice shapes like so. This is the brush a lot of people prefer to use as their primer brush. Personally, I'm not using this a whole lot, but that's simply due to personal preference. Then we have the clay strips brush. The clay strips brush is similar to the clay builder brush from ZBrush. And if we just make this a little bit bigger and we go on to his back here, we can see what this is doing. This one acts more like a clay brush, which actually builds up volume like so. 
Now, the, a problem with this brush by default is that it's too rough. There's too much texture in this. At least this is too rough for my personal taste because there's a lot of noise left in the model. So what I prefer to do is I prefer to go to brush and then we go to tip roundness and we set this to something like 0.5. Now you can see that this brush becomes much more manageable right away. Something I prefer to do as well is I prefer to disable pen pressure on the radius. Because what you can see now is that when I'm, I'm pressing a light like so, there's a small brush and a light pressure. If I go, if I have a hard pressure, it becomes a, a big brush and a hard and, and like a lot of strength to it. I don't like these two are coupled. So what I'll do is I'll go on a radius and I'll simply disable this icon right here, which means that it's not going to use pen pressure for the radius. Which means if I'm sculpting now, I have a lot more control over the actual stroke. Because now I can build up volume by ho by having a harder pressure, and I can build less volume by having a less pressure to it. And if I need to go in and be more specific, I'll simply zoom in like so, and I'll just sculpt like so. Or I'll just change the brush size of it. This is the brush I use 90% of the time. Clay strips with the radius disabled for the pen pressure, brush, uh, tip roundness set to around 0.5. You don't have to be 100% accurate when it comes to the settings. They're more, more whatever you prefer. Then we have the grab brush. The grab brush is also known as the move brush in other software. And this simply allows you to move things around. Very cool. Well, not very cool, <laughs> very practical. It's not a particularly fun brush, but it's a very useful brush. You can get a lot of things done simply with the move brush where you can drastically change the shape of whatever you are sculpting. Then we look at the draw sharp brush, which you can find up here. This is also known as uh, the damp standard brush in ZBrush. It's not exactly the same, but it's fairly similar. And what this allows you to do is to create these nice little creases like so. So you now you can see that we're just getting these really lovely little creases, which can be folds, scars, or just more precision in your model. So I use this a fair bit. Uh, you can also uh, hold down the control key and now it's going to do the opposite, meaning it's going to sculpt outwards. So you can use this to create these really nice sharp lines like so. And then we will have a look at the inflate brush, where it simply inflates whatever we are sculpting at. You can see that now stuff has been pushed at or normal. So in a case like this, you're just going to get more volume into the wrinkles. Just be aware that right now we are getting overlapping shapes. So you just want to be careful that you don't overlap too much. But this is a really nice brush to really just add more volume to the different shapes. And of course, we have the smooth brush as well, which we mentioned is on the shift key. What you can see now, though, is that this is too strong. It actually nukes the entire shape, and we don't really want that. We want this to be much more subtle. So what we can do, we can select the smooth brush, click, it, click on it right here. We can set the strength down to something like 0.2, and then we can hold on the shift key again, and then we can just have a much more uh, subdued smooth brush. So this, the intensity is independent based on different brushes. You can see here, if we set this to the clay brush, just point, almost 0.7, we go back to this, it remembers the intensity of it, which is really important because otherwise a smooth brush would be insanely strong. What I recommend you to do as well is to set up some hotkeys on these brushes. You can very easily do this by right mouse button on the brush, and then you can add a hotkey to it. We already have a hotkey, uh, but you can very easily do this just by right clicking and adding hotkey. We can add this to the layer brush, for instance. So just a side shortcut, and then you can simply hit the key you want. For the brushes, the hotkeys I'm using is for the draw brush, I am using one. So if I hit the one on the keyboard, it takes me to the draw brush. If I want to go to the clay strips brush, I hit the two key. If I want to use the grab brush, I hit three. And then for draw sharp, I hit four. This means without having to go in here at all, I can just hit one, two, three, and four, and it just changes between the brushes, which means I don't really need this menu at all. You can just move it entirely because this is this will contain all the brushes I really ever use. Another brush, which is quite fun, <laughs> this is not that practical, but it's a really fun brush, is the Elastic Deform brush. And this allows you to more like elastically push and pull things around. It's almost like it's made out of jello, and now you can just really push and pull proportions around uh, without it being too uh, defining. Like with the, the, the grab brush really just moves the area, but with the Elastic Deform, you can move the area around it. Now you see the entire body is almost like shaking from this and wobbling around. So this is a really fun brush if you're doing character design changes, where you, you can more elastically move things around like so. 
And if you want to use symmetry, you simply go all the way up to the top right. And here you have this little butterfly. Simply hit on the axis you want your symmetry to be enabled on. And now you can see the symmetry has indeed been enabled. So if you want to disable it, you can just hit the X key up here. And now symmetry has been disabled. Enable again. And there we go. Very nice and easy. If you want more options as well, you can also enable that by clicking on this little triangle and that opens up more options like so. Then we're going to look into how we can add more polygons to our model. There are three main ways of doing this in Blender. The first one is Dyn Turbo. This is known as Sculptors Pro in ZBrush, where you can sculpt, where you can add local details where you are sculpting. Then we have remeshing, which is going to remesh the entire model, giving you a lot of uh, resolution everywhere, which is known as Dynamesh in ZBrush. And then the last one is going to be using the multi-resolution modifier, which is similar to subdivisions in ZBrush, which simply non-destructively adds resolution by multiplying your poly count by four at any, the end, at any time. So the first one we will check out is Dyn Topo. I've enabled wireframe here, just so we can see what's actually going on. So the first thing we do is we go to Dyn Topo and then we can see what happens when we just start to sculpt. Now what, do you, what happens is that uh, we are reducing the polygon, but see what happens if we were to zoom in now. Now you can see the polygon is increasing based on our screen resolution or rather how close we are. So if you want to add a lot of resolution to one area, let's say you want to add a resolution to the ear, you can simply zoom quite far in and then you can start to sculpt right here. If you want to reduce it, you simply go far away and now you can start to sculpt here to reduce the poly count. This is really useful because this allows you to have really fine control over the detail of your model. Now you can go on a dyn topo and you can change the detail size here, where if we now were to change it just to a lower number, you can see that we have now a higher poly count. The reason why a lower number is a higher poly count is because it's the density, it's the density between the different vertices. So if you want to go in here and, and set this to a high number again, now you can see that we're going to be reducing this even more. So what, we have a few modes here. The ones we are going to be covering is going to be relative detail and brush detail. Relative detail is what we're using currently, which simply means that it's the detail is relative to your proximity of the camera. So if we go close, we can now get a lot more detail. If you go far away, we get less detail. If we change the detailing to brush detail on, on the other hand, then you can see if our detailing is based on the brush size. So now if we make a big brush, we get less details. If we make the brush tiny, we get a lot of details. Which one you use is entirely up to you. One of them isn't better than the other, and it's entirely down to personal preference. I personally prefer sticking to relative detail, but again, <laughs> entirely up to what you prefer. This is an excellent tool if you want to reduce your poly count in certain areas. Maybe you have a high poly model and you want to reduce that or you want more resolution in one area. This is a fantastic tool for that. Where Dyntopo also shines is if you are doing a lot of cool concepting. For instance, if we were to use the snake hook brush here, now we can start to add all sorts of crazy stuff to his back. So now we can just start to drag out different shapes like so. We can just go into Dyntopo and just decrease the detail size. And now you can see that we can just drag these things out. This is really cool because it allows you to change the design rapidly just with a few strokes. So if you want to add some kind of wings here or some crazy scapulas or anything like that, you can just drag this out and um, it will be there right away. I will just disable wireframe as well. And then we're back just so this doesn't completely kill the compression of the video. So this is a really cool way of working now because now you can just move stuff around. You can very quickly change things around. You can just add new limbs to it. You can add new joints, whatever you want to do. Dyntopo allows you to work crazy fast when it comes to concepting. So in short, Dyntopo allows you to add resolution locally where you are sculpting. Then we will simply disable Dyntopo as well. And then we will move on to remesh. Oh, it's the last thing as well. Dyntopo can be enabled by hitting the control D key. So hit control and D and now Dyntopo is enabled or disabled. Then we have remeshing. Remeshing is really useful as well, but it's useful in a different way than uh, Dyntopo. Well, Dyntopo adds local topology where you're sculpting. Remeshing will add resolution everywhere. You can access uh, remeshing by hitting control and R. And now you can see that this just changes the entire resolution of the model where in this area now is all nice and unified. 
This is fantastic if you are concepting as well and you just want to have an even nice resolution everywhere. Don't topo tends to give you ni nasty and triangulated topology while um, remeshing will give you nice and proper topology to work with. But as you can see here, if you used, were to use something like Snakehook, you can't just drag it out infinitely because you are running out of resolution. And this is where Dyntopo shines because instead of having to subdivide your model and go in with Dyntopo, you can simply control an R and then it's going to remesh it. Which means now we can start adding, we can start adding more things to it and we can add more uh, shapes to this like so. And then we can control an R again and then we can simply remesh it. If you shift an R, now you can see the grid. This is really useful. I really enjoy this about Blender where bigger grid size means bigger polygons. Basically think about the grid size here as the size of the polygons and smaller grid size, a smaller grid size means smaller polygons, meaning higher resolution meshes. So let's say you want a pretty low res base. You can just set it to something like this, then control and R. And now you can see that the polygon size is approximately the same as what we set before. You can also change settings under remeshing and you can change your voxel size right here as well. I will just undo this real quick. So my personal preference when I'm sculpting is really using remeshing when I'm doing the concepting phase. I use Dyntopa, but not as much as I use remeshing. And then the last method of adding polygons we're going to be covering is using the multi-resolution modifier. And we can use that when we have a model more like this. This is where we have maybe some decent topology. At least we're in a spot where we don't need to concept something up from scratch. We want to refine what is there. Dyntopo and Multires are fantastic when it comes to concepting, but they're not very good once your base is already there. So what I'll do now is I'll select my model, then I'll hit Control and Tab. Then I'll go into sculpt mode. And then we are going to be going to modifiers, add modifier, and then we're going to be adding a multi-resolution modifier. Now, what this allows us to do is allows us to subdivide our model. And now you can see that we have added another subdivision level and the model becomes smoother. So now if you want to use the draw brush here, for instance, and we want to add some kind of details here, and we want more resolution, we can simply subdivide again. And now you can see we are getting an even higher resolution, which is really useful. What's handy about this is that this is non-destructive. So if we want to go up and down, we can simply go under the sculpt mode here, and then we can simply reduce the resolution. So you can always go up and down. So if you want to do bigger changes to your model, you can go down and you can do it there, and then you can go up again and do more granular tweaks there. What you can also see here though, is that uh, we have an independent slider between the render mode, sculpt mode, and the local, the, the, and the level viewport, which means that if we were to sculpt like so, and then go back into object mode, our sculpting disappears. And that is because we haven't set the viewport to actually respond to the sculpting. So if we do that, now you can see it changes. Then we go all the way up and now we have the same level as we had in the sculpting. This is really handy because it allows us to keep this independent, meaning that if we go into sculpt more now, we can have all these nice details and we can keep sculpting on our model. While at the same time, if we have a lot of object in our scenes, we can keep the polygon really low. Just make sure that the render resolution is the same as your sculpting resolution. And again, you hit subdivide in order to add more resolution to your model. Now, there's a little bug here as well that if you were to uh, subdivide and um, sculpt and then undo, it's going to undo the subdivision and the sculpting. So just be aware of that, that if you are using subdivisions and you keep undoing, it might undo the subdivision as well as the actual stroke. Next up, let's look at masking. Masking is a feature which prevents you from sculpting on certain areas. And you can access this if you go down here a little bit, just hold the middle mouse button to go up and down. Then we hit mask. And now if we were to just make a bigger brush size, and now we can just paint like so. And now you can see everything that is being painted on will turn a darker shade of gray. And if we try to sculpt on this now, simply by using one of our brushes, now you can see that we can't sculpt on this area. This is really useful because sometimes you just want to avoid sculpting on certain areas. You can also bring up a pie menu if you hit the A key and where, where you can now do something like sharpen the mask. You can shrink the mask, you can grow the mask, invert it, invert again, soften the mask, and you can clear the mask as well. So this is how I normally do it. If I want to use masking, I will use the mask brush to just paint the mask in a certain area. You can also hit Shift and F to make this even stronger. So paint the mask like so. 
and then hit the A key to soften it a little bit, sculpt whatever I need to sculpt, and then I will hit the A key and simply clear the mask. So pretty intuitive once you get into this. An example of where you want to, might want to use masking is if you want to, for instance, move the eyelids together, close the eyelids. Now you can mask the top part here. And then we can soften the mask a little bit, hit A and then uh, so smooth mask. Then we can use the uh, grab brush, which we can access by the three key. And now we can go in and we can start to uh, move the bottom lip lid up a little bit and the top is not affected at all. And then we can hit A. That was not A, <laughs> that was S, undo that. And then we can hit, um, then we can hit invert mask and now we can get the top lid to go down as well. So now we can start to close one of these eyes in a fairly intuitive way without having to go a lot of back and forth. So this is how I tend to use masking. Hit the A again and then clear mask. I will also delete the multi-res modifier because next up we will look into face sets. Face sets can be found here on the bottom where we have draw face sets. And if we just start to draw a face set now, you can see that we get a different color in this area. The reason why face sets are awesome is because we can now hide the face sets or hide, and, or hide other face sets. So for instance, if we want to hide only the, um, the eyes now, we can hover over it, hit the H key. And now you can only focus on the eyes, which is fantastic. If you want to have another face set, you can just paint that where you want to go. And I can hit the H to hide that, H to hide that, and H to hide the other one as well. Now, if you want to continue drawing a face set, you can hold on a control key with the draw face sets brush enabled. And now you just hold on a control while hovering over one of the face sets. So if you want the green one to extend down, you hover over the green one, then we go down like so. You want to extend the pink purple one here, hold down control key and just draw on top of this. Another really handy feature is that we can make face sets under our cursor if we hit Shift and W. So now we hit Shift and W and you just drag like so, you can hit create face sets. So if you want to face it for the nose here, you can hold down Shift and W and just drag it out like so. Face it for the eye, Shift and W, drag it out. And then you can of course go in and you can start to refine it. So if you want to refine this a little bit now, you can hold on a control key and just paint out a face set like so. Hold on a control key and just paint over while hovering over the other way to shrink it down like so. If you want to grow a face set, you can also do that very easily. You can just by hitting Control and W, it's going to grow it, and Control Alt W is going to shrink it like so. You can also get more features up here as well. In the top left, we have face sets, and here you see a lot more features. Speaking of that as well, something I forgot to mention is we have the same here for masking as well. So there are a lot more features under masking, which you can leverage right here. Though most of them are available on the A hotkey. Next up, we will have a look at how we can work with multiple objects. If we were to just enable the other guy now, now this doesn't look like the best scene in the world, but just bear with me here. Let's say we want to sculpt on um, the head here, and then we will, uh, let's just say we want to use the uh, the draw brush on this guy. So we just want to do some sculpting on this guy. And then we want to do some sculpting on the other one. Now, the way you can do this is you can, of course, hit control and tab, go into object mode, click on this guy, and then we can go into sculpt mode and then we can sculpt there. Now that works, but the more intuitive way of doing this is simply by going over here in the outliner. And then you see next to the object we currently have active, you see there is a little uh, tick box here, a little like an eyedropper or something. Then we click on the, um, the dot next to the one we want to sculpt on next. And now you can see that this gets the same icon. So simply by clicking on the, uh, the little uh, dot icon, we can switch between objects we want to sculpt on. So now we are sculpting on this object, click here, and now we can sculpt on this object. Go back and sculpt on this object. So that's quite intuitive when it comes to switching objects. It's not as intuitive as it could be, but it's a lot better than having to go in and out of object and sculpt mode all the time. Now, the last thing we are going to be covering is using matte caps. Matte caps are simply different ways of displaying your model. And you can find that up here in the top right. And here we have viewport shading and under lighting, we have matte caps. The reason you want to change the matte cap is to get a different view of your model. Currently we are using this one, which is all the way to top left, which is the default one. Though you can also change this to a different one as well. I'm just going to clear all the different um, face sets we have. Hit the W key and then face sets from visible. And there we go. 
And then we can simply go up here and um, we can go into matcaps and we can change this around. So there are a few different matcaps here and some of these are great and some of these are terrible. Some of, these, some of the ones you don't really want to be using are these ones here, which are too shiny and not enough contrast in them. I really do prefer using either the first or the second one. I really prefer avoiding this one because this just makes your model look kind of bad in my opinion, but it's essentially a different way of evaluating your model. Now there are two advantages to switching the matcap. The purely is purely visual where you just prefer it. You think it's a lot better to sculpt using this matcap here, for instance, and that just makes your eyes happy. Totally valid reason. Now, the second one is that you can evaluate a model in different ways. The matcap is not the final look of your model. Some of them might exaggerate the form too much, some of them not enough. So you want to make sure that you have a nice balanced matcap so that when you start to render the model, it actually looks the way you expect your model to look. So I also recommend going into changing some of the settings for the matcap as well if you want. For instance, sometimes using cavity is really handy, uh, though be careful with it because it really accentuates the model. Here you can see exactly what I mean. The model looks like it has more volume with cavity enabled than it does without it. So you want to make sure that cavity is generally disabled, though it can be quite handy as well in certain cases. Uh, but I also just re recommend experimenting with some of these settings here as well. You can get pretty fun results if you go and experiment with some of these ones. You can change the color and now you can just change the entire color of your model. But in short, matte caps are really handy because they allow you to see the model in a slightly different light and it can be more fun to sculpt with the model like so. So that's it for our very quick and brief introduction to how to sculpt in Blender. Now, as a reminder, we very much have our Introduction to Sculpting in Blender course available as well. So if you are interested in taking Sculpting in Blender more seriously, I highly recommend this course where we are covering a lot of the features we just did in this video, just with a lot more depth. We're covering here how to use really high frequency alphas. We are covering how to sculpt Suzanne from scratch into this weird creepy monkey. And overall, just how to get comfortable with sculpting in Blender along with a lot more sculpting fundamentals. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you wanna see more sculpting videos like this in the future, let us know in the comments. We would love to hear what you think about uh, sculpting in Blender as well. And overall, thank you so much for watching.